Fast Asleep. Welcome to Fast Asleep with Gina Marie. Yes, I'm Gina, and yes, there is a Marie. And guess what? Marie will be here next week with the first question regarding those key words that you and I have been asking about. <sighs> Finally. Ah, listeners. I'm so glad you're here, and I am such a lucky person. You all immediately picked up on my, what would you call that, whining? And now our so-so subscription numbers are going up. Thank you so much, and thank you for your comments. They are always so kind and so fun. Thanks to all of you. First-time listeners, welcome to you. You have found the perfect place to settle in for, we all know this now, don't we? A classic story by an award-winning author. We're glad you are here, too. Now, this is for one particular listener. I hope I'm saying this right. At Robla 100, you personally are responsible for bringing me one of my new, most favorite short stories. I love author Willa Cather's works, but I didn't know anything about this story. And thanks to you at Roblo 100, it's all ready to go for today's episode. So, Willa, short for Willella, Cather, oh, I know. Truman Capote knew her and pronounced her name as Cather. And so did I when I featured her work in, um, I'm looking it up, uh, episode 271, The Burglar's Christmas. I said Cather then, but since then, everywhere I turn, it is pronounced Cather. So I give in. Willa Cather was born in Virginia in 1873, and she supported herself as a magazine editor and a high school English teacher. Oh, now that will ring a bell later in today's episode. And in her 30s, she became a managing editor at McClure's Magazine in New York City. She was the most powerful woman in journalism at that time, 1906. Mr. McClure himself thought she was the perfect problem-solving executive. But he told her she had little talent for writing. And at the time, she agreed with him and wrote this. When it comes to writing, I'm a newborn baby every time, always coming to it naked and shivering. Well, okay. Fortunately, she put on some clothes and straightened herself out because within a few years, she'd managed to write three novels, all three very popular, and all three critical successes. Oh, and let's not forget the Pulitzer Prize that she won for her World War I novel, One of Ours. F. Scott Fitzgerald saw himself as a failure compared to her. Okay. <laughs> Before those novels, she wrote some engrossing short stories. I don't think you'll soon forget today's story. And again, thank you at Roblo 100. No, today's story is unforgettable. It's presented in two parts. Alrighty, first published in 1905. Tuck in, everybody, for part one of Willa Cather's Paul's Case. What you got going on? High nose, eyes closed, holding on. And I don't want another. Day to break. It was Paul's afternoon to appear before the faculty of the Pittsburgh High School 
to account for his various misdemeanors. He had been suspended a week ago, and his father had called at the principal's office and confessed his perplexity about his son. Paul entered the faculty room, suave and smiling. His clothes were a trifle outgrown, and the tan velvet on the collar of his open overcoat was frayed and worn, but for all that, there was something of the dandy about him, and he wore an opal pin in his neatly knotted black four in hand, his necktie, and a red carnation in his buttonhole. Now this latter adornment, the faculty somehow felt was not properly significant of the contrite spirit befitting a boy under the ban of suspension. Paul was tall for his age and very thin, with high cramped shoulders and a narrow chest. His eyes were remarkable for a certain hysterical brilliancy and he continually used them in a conscious, theatrical sort of way, peculiarly offensive in a boy. The pupils were abnormally large, as though he were addicted to belladonna, but there was a glassy glitter about them, which that drug does not produce. When questioned by the principal as to why he was there, Paul stated, politely enough, that he wanted to come back to school. This was a lie. But Paul was quite accustomed to lying, found it indeed indispensable for overcoming friction. His teachers were asked to state their respective charges against him which they did with such a rancor and a grievedness as evinced that this was not a usual case. Disorder and impertinence were among the offenses named, yet each of his instructors felt that it was scarcely possible to put into words the real cause of the trouble, which lay in a sort of hysterically defiant manner of the boys, and in the contempt which they all knew he felt for them, and which he seemingly made not the least effort to conceal. Once, when he had been making a synopsis of a paragraph at the blackboard, his English teacher had stepped to his side and attempted to guide his hand. Paul had started back with a shudder and thrust his hands violently behind him. The astonished woman could scarcely have been more hurt and embarrassed had he struck at her. The insult was so involuntary and definitely personal as to be unforgettable. In one way and another, he had made all his teachers, men and women alike, conscious of the same feeling of physical aversion. In one class, he habitually sat with his hand shading his eyes. In another, he always looked out of the window during the recitation, and in another he made a running commentary on the lecture with humorous intent. His teachers felt this afternoon that his whole attitude was symbolized by his shrug and his flippantly red carnation flower and they fell upon him. 
without mercy, his English teacher leading the pack. He stood through it, smiling, his pale lips parted over his white teeth. His lips were continuously twitching, and he had a habit of raising his eyebrows that was contemptuous and irritating to the last degree. Older boys than Paul had broken down and shed tears under that ordeal, but his set smile did not once desert him, and his only sign of discomfort was the nervous trembling of the fingers that toyed with the buttons of his overcoat and an occasional jerking of the other hand which held his hat. Paul was always smiling, always glancing about him, seeming to feel that people might be watching him and trying to detect something. This conscious expression, since it was as far as possible from boyish mirthfulness was usually attributed to insolence or smartness. As the Inquisition proceeded, one of his instructors repeated an impertinent remark of the boys, and the principal asked him whether he thought that a courteous speech to make to a woman. Paul shrugged his shoulders slightly and his eyebrows twitched. I don't know, he replied. I didn't mean it to be polite or impolite either. I, I guess it's a sort of way I have of saying things regardless. The principal asked him whether he didn't think that a way it would be well to get rid of. Paul grinned and said he guessed so. When he was told that he could go, he bowed gracefully and went out. His bow was like a repetition of the scandalous red carnation. His teachers were in despair, and his drawing master voiced the feeling of them all when he declared there was something about the boy which none of them understood. He added, I don't really believe that smile comes from insolence. There's something sort of haunted about it. The boy is not strong, for one thing. There is something wrong about the fellow. The drawing master had come to realize that in looking at Paul, one saw only his white teeth and the forced animation of his eyes. One warm afternoon, the boy had gone to sleep at his drawing board, and his master had noted with amazement what a white, blue-veined face it was, drawn and wrinkled like an old man's, about the eyes, the lips twitching even in his sleep. His teachers left the building dissatisfied and unhappy, humiliated to have felt so vindictive toward a mere boy, to have uttered this feeling in cutting terms, and to have set each other on, as it were, in the gruesome game of intemperate reproach. One of them remembered, having seen a miserable street cat set at bay by a ring of tormentors. As for Paul, 
he ran down the hill, whistling the soldier's chorus from Faust. Looking wildly behind him now and then to see whether some of his teachers were not there to witness his lightheartedness. As it was now late in the afternoon, and Paul was on duty that evening as usher at Carnegie Hall, he decided that he would not go home to supper. When he reached the concert hall, the doors were not yet open. It was chilly outside, and he decided to go up into the picture gallery, always deserted at this hour, where there were some of Raffaelli's gay studies of Paris streets, and an airy blue Venetian scene or two that always exhilarated him. He was delighted to find no one in the gallery but the old guard who sat in the corner, a newspaper on his knee, a black patch over one eye, and the other closed. Paul possessed himself of the place and walked confidently up and down, whistling under his breath. After a while, he sat down before a blue Rico and lost himself. When he bethought him to look at his watch, ooh, it was after seven o'clock, and he rose with a start and ran downstairs, making a face at Augustus Caesar peering out from the cast room, and an evil gesture at the Venus of Milo as he passed her on the stairway. When Paul reached the usher's dressing room, half a dozen boys were already there, and he began excitedly to tumble into his uniform. It was one of the few that at all approached fitting, and Paul thought it very becoming, though he knew the tight, straight coat accentuated his narrow chest, about which he was exceedingly sensitive. He was always excited while he dressed, twanging all over to the tuning of the strings and the preliminary flourishes of the horns in the music room. But tonight, he seemed quite beside himself, and he teased and plagued the boys until telling him that he was crazy, they put him down on the floor and sat on him. <laughs> Somewhat calmed by his suppression, Paul dashed out to the front of the house to seat the early comers. He was a model usher. Gracious and smiling, he ran up and down the aisles. Nothing was too much trouble for him. He carried messages and brought programs as though it were his greatest pleasure in life, and all the people in his section thought him a charming boy, feeling that he remembered and admired them. As the house filled, he grew more and more vivacious and animated, and the color came to his cheeks and lips. It was very much as though this were a great reception, and Paul were the host. Just as the musicians came out to take their places, his English teacher arrived. With checks for the seats, which a prominent manufacturer had taken for the season, she betrayed some embarrassment when she handed Paul the tickets and a hauteur which subsequently made her feel very foolish. Paul was startled for a moment and had the feeling of wanting to put her out. What business had she here among all these fine people in gay colors? He looked her over and decided that <laughs> she was not appropriately dressed and must be a fool to sit downstairs in such togs. The tickets had probably been sent her out of kindness, he reflected, as he put down a seat for her, and she, 
had about as much right to sit there as he had. When the symphony began, Paul sank into one of the rear seats with a long sigh of relief and lost himself, as he had done before the Rico. It was not that symphonies as such meant anything in particular to Paul, but the first sigh of the instruments seemed to free some hilarious spirit within him, something that struggled there like the genie in the bottle found by the Arab fisherman. He felt a sudden zest of life. The lights danced before his eyes, and the concert hall blazed into unimaginable splendor. When the soprano soloist came on, Paul forgot even the nastiness of his teachers being there, and gave himself up to the peculiar intoxication such personages always had for him. The soloist chanced to be a German woman, by no means in her first youth, and the mother of many children, but she wore a satin gown and a tiara, and she had that indefinable air of achievement, that world shine upon her, which always blinded Paul to any possible defects. After a concert was over, mm, Paul was often irritable and wretched until he got to sleep. And tonight, he was even more than usually restless. He had the feeling of not being able to let down, of its being impossible to give up this delicious excitement, which was the only thing that could be called living at all. During the last number, he withdrew, and after hastily changing his clothes in the dressing room, slipped out to the side door where the singer's carriage stood. Here he began pacing rapidly up and down the walk, waiting to see her come out. Over yonder, the Shenley, in its vacant stretch, loomed big and square through the fine rain, the windows of its twelve stories glowing like those of a lighted cardboard house under a Christmas tree. All the actors and singers of any importance stayed there when they were in the city, and a number of the big manufacturers of the place lived there in the winter. Paul had often hung about the hotel, watching the people go in and out, longing to enter and leave schoolmasters and dull care behind him forever. At last, the singer came out, accompanied by the conductor, who helped her into her carriage and closed the door with a cordial Auf Wiedersehen, which set Paul to wondering whether she were not an old sweetheart of his. Paul followed the carriage over to the hotel, walking so rapidly as not to be far from the entrance when the singer alighted and disappeared behind the swinging glass doors, which were opened by a man in a tall hat and a long coat. In the moment that the door was ajar, it seemed to Paul that he too entered he seemed to feel himself go after her 
up the steps into the warm, lighted building, into an exotic, a tropical world of shiny, glistening surfaces and basking ease. He reflected upon the mysterious dishes that were brought into the dining room, the green bottles and buckets of ice, as he had seen them in the supper party pictures of the Sunday supplement. A quick gust of wind brought the rain down with sudden vehemence, and Paul was startled to find that he was still outside in the slush of the gravel driveway, that his boots were letting in the water, and his scanty overcoat was clinging wet about him that the lights in front of the concert hall were out and that the rain was driving in sheets between him and the orange glow of the windows above him. There it was. What he wanted tangibly before him like the fairy world of a Christmas pantomime. As the rain beat in his face, Paul wondered whether he were destined always to shiver in the black night outside, looking up at it. He turned and walked reluctantly toward the car tracks. The end had to come sometime. What you got going on? High notes, eyes closed, holding on. And I don't want another Date and break mm-hmm. and take off, steal off, night away. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Oh, shut up. He turned and walked reluctantly toward the car tracks. The end had to come sometime. His father in his night clothes at the top of the stairs, explanations that did not explain, hastily improvised fictions that were forever tripping him up, his upstairs room and its horrible yellow wallpaper, the creaking bureau with the greasy plush collar box, and over his painted wooden bed, the pictures of George Washington and John Calvin, and the framed motto, Feed My Lambs, which had been worked in red worsted by his mother, whom Paul could not remember. Half an hour later, Paul alighted from the Negley Avenue car and went slowly down one of the side streets off the main thoroughfare. It was a highly respectable street where all the houses were exactly alike and where businessmen of moderate means begot and reared 
large families of children, all of whom went to Sabbath school and learned the shorter catechism and were interested in arithmetic, all of whom were exactly alike as their homes and a piece of a piece with the monotony in which they lived. Paul never went up Cordelia Street without a shudder of loathing. His home was next to the house of the Cumberland minister. He approached it tonight with the nerveless sense of defeat, the hopeless feeling of sinking back forever into ugliness and commonness that he had always had when he came home. The moment he turned into Cordelia Street, he felt the waters close above his head. After each of these orgies of living, he experienced all the physical depression which follows a debauch. The loathing of respectable beds, of common food, of a house permeated by kitchen odors, a shuddering repulsion for the flavorless, colorless mass of everyday existence, a morbid desire for cool things and soft lights and fresh flowers. The nearer he approached the house, the more absolutely unequal Paul felt to the sight of it all. His ugly sleeping chamber, the cold bathroom with the grimy zinc tub, the cracked mirror, the dripping spigots, uh, his father at the top of the stairs, his hairy legs sticking out from his nightshirt, his feet thrust into carpet slippers. He was so much later than usual. Oh, there would be certainly inquiries and reproaches. Paul stopped short before the door. He felt that he could not be accosted by his father tonight. That he could not toss again on that miserable bed. He would not go in. He would uh, tell his father that he had no car fare and it was raining so hard he had gone home with one of the boys and stayed all night. Meanwhile, he was wet and cold. He went around to the back of the house and tried one of the basement windows, found it open, raised it cautiously, and scrambled down the cellar wall to the floor. There he stood, holding his breath, terrified by the noise he had made. But the floor above him was silent, and there was no creak on the stairs. He found a soapbox and carried it over to the soft ring of light that streamed from the furnace door and sat down. Oh, he was horribly afraid of rats, so he did not try to sleep, but sat looking distrustfully at the dark, still terrified lest he might have awakened his father. In such reactions, after one of the experiences which made days and nights out of the dreary blanks of the calendar, when his senses were deadened, Paul's head was always singularly clear. Suppose his father had heard him getting in at the window and had come down and shot him for a burglar. And then again, 
suppose. His father had come down, pistol in hand, and he had cried out in time to save himself. Oh, and his father had been horrified to think how nearly he had killed him. Then again, suppose, a day should come when his father would remember that night and wish there had been no warning cry to stay his hand. With this last supposition, Paul entertained himself until daybreak. The following Sunday was fine. The sodden November chill was broken by the last flash of autumnal summer. In the morning, Paul had to go to church and Sabbath school, as always. On seasonable Sunday afternoons, the burghers of Cordelia Street usually sat out on their front stoops and talked to their neighbors on the next stoop or called to those across the street in neighborly fashion. The men sat placidly on gay cushions placed upon the steps that led down to the sidewalk, while the women, in their Sunday waists, blouses, sat in rockers on the cramped porches, pretending to be greatly at their ease. The children played in the streets. Oh, there were so many of them that the place resembled the recreation grounds of a kindergarten. The men on the steps, all in their shirt sleeves, their vests unbuttoned, sat with their legs well apart, their stomachs comfortably protruding, and talked of the prices of things, or told anecdotes of the sagacity of their various chiefs and overlords. They occasionally looked over the multitude of squabbling children, listened affectionately to their high-pitched nasal voices, smiling to see their own proclivities reproduced in their offspring, and interspersed their legends of the Iron Kings with remarks about their son's progress at school, their grades in arithmetic, and the amounts they had saved in their toy banks. On this last Sunday of November, Paul sat all the afternoon on the lowest step of his stoop, staring into the street, while his sisters in their rockers were talking to the minister's daughters next door about how many shirtwaists they'd made in the last week and how many waffles someone had eaten at the last church supper. When the weather was warm and his father was in a particularly jovial frame of mind, the girls made lemonade, which was always brought out in a red glass pitcher ornamented with forget-me-nots in blue enamel. Oh, this the girls thought very fine, and the neighbors joked about the suspicious color of the pitcher. Today, Paul's father on the top step was talking to a young man who shifted a restless baby from knee to knee. He happened to be the young man who was daily held up to Paul as a model, after whom it was his father's dearest hope that he would pattern. This young man was of a ruddy complexion with a compressed red mouth and faded, nearsighted eyes, over which he wore thick spectacles with gold bows that curved about his ears. He was a clerk to one of the magnets of a great steel corporation and was looked upon in Cordelia Street as a young man with a future. There was a story that some five years ago, he was now barely 26, he had been a trifle dissipated. But in order to curb his appetites, 
and save the loss of time and strength that a sowing of wild oats might have entailed, he had taken his chief's advice, oft reiterated to his employees, and at twenty-one had married the first woman whom he could persuade to share his fortunes. Now, she happened to be an angular schoolmistress, much older than he, who also wore thick glasses, and who had now borne him four children, all nearsighted like herself. The young man was relating how his chief, now cruising in the Mediterranean, kept in touch with all the details of the business, arranging his office hours on his yacht, just as though he were at home, and knocking off work enough to keep two stenographers busy. His father told, in turn, the plan his corporation was considering of putting in an electric railway plant at Cairo. Paul snapped his teeth. He had an awful apprehension that they might spoil it all before he got there. Yet, he rather liked to hear these legends of the Iron Kings that were told and retold on Sundays and holidays. These stories of palaces in Venice, yachts on the Mediterranean, oh, and high play at Monte Carlo. They all appealed to his fancy, and he was interested in the triumphs of cash boys who had become famous, though he had no mind for the cash boy stage. After supper was over, and he had helped to dry the dishes, Paul nervously asked his father whether he could go to George's to get some help in his geometry, and still more nervously asked for car fare. Oh, this latter request he had to repeat, as his father, on principle, did not like to hear requests for money, whether much or little. He asked Paul whether he could not go to some boy who lived nearer, and told him that he ought not to leave his schoolwork until Sunday. But he gave him the dime. Oh, he was not a poor man. But he had a worthy ambition to come up in the world. His only reason for allowing Paul to usher was that he thought a boy ought to be earning a little. Paul bounded up the stairs, scrubbed the greasy odor of the dishwater from his hands with the ill-smelling soap he hated, and then shook over his fingers a few drops of violet water from the bottle he kept hidden in his drawer. He left the house with his geometry conspicuously under his arm, and the moment he got out of Cordelia Street and boarded a downtown car, oh, he shook off the lethargy of two deadening days and began to live again. The leading juvenile of the permanent stock company, which played at one of the downtown theaters, was an acquaintance of Paul's, and the boy had been invited to drop in at the Sunday night rehearsals whenever he could. For more than a year, Paul had spent every available moment loitering about Charlie Edwards's dressing room. He had won a place among Edwards's following, not only because the young actor, who could not afford to employ a dresser, often found him useful, but because he recognized in Paul something akin to what churchmen term vocation. It was at the theater and at Carnegie Hall that Paul really lived. The rest was but a sleep and a forgetting. This was Paul's fairy tale, and it had for him all the allurement of a secret love. 
the moment he inhaled the gassy, painty, dusty odor behind the scenes, he breathed like a prisoner set free and felt within, within him, the possibility of doing or saying splendid, brilliant things. The moment the cracked orchestra beat out the overture from Martha or jerked at the serenade from Rigoletto, all stupid and ugly things slid from him, and his senses were deliciously, yet delicately, fired. Perhaps it was because in Paul's world, the natural nearly always wore the guise of ugliness, that a certain element of artificiality seemed to him necessary in beauty. Perhaps it was because his experiences of life elsewhere was so full of Sabbath school picnics, petty economies, wholesome advice as to how to succeed in life and the unescapable odors of cooking, that he found this existence so alluring, these smartly clad men and women so attractive, that he was so moved by these starry apple orchards that bloomed perennial, perennially under the limelight. It would be difficult to put it strongly enough how convincingly the stage entrance of that theater was, for Paul, the actual portal of romance. Certainly, none of the company ever suspected it, least of all Charlie Edwards. It was very like the old stories that used to float about London of fabulously rich men who had subterranean halls with palms and fountains and soft lamps and richly apparelled women who never saw the disenchanting light of London day. So in the midst of that smoke-palled city, enamored of figures and grimy toil, Paul had his secret temple his wishing carpet, his bit of blue and white Mediterranean shore, bathed in perpetual sunshine. Several of Paul's teachers had a theory that his imagination had been perverted by garish fiction. But the truth was, he scarcely ever read at all. The books at home were not such as would either tempt or corrupt a youthful mind. And as for reading the novels that some of his friends urged upon him, well, he got what he wanted much more quickly from music. Any sort of music, from an orchestra to a barrel organ. He needed only the spark, the indescribable thrill that made his imagination, master of his senses. Oh, and he could make plots and pictures enough of his own. It was equally true that he was not stage-struck, not, at any rate, in the usual acceptation of that expression. He had no desire to become an actor, any more than he had to become a musician. He felt no necessity to do any of these things. What he wanted was to see, to be in the atmosphere, float on the wave of it, to be carried out blue league after blue league away from everything what you got going on high notes 
Introduction information for this episode is from Andy Jewell, Associate Professor and University Libraries Editor of the Willa Cather Archive at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and other sources in our show notes. Music for this episode is Warm Shadow by Think. Summoning and Seduction by Adam Hurst. Dark Cello by Maurizio Mignone. Soldier's Chorus Faust from Kids Classic Music. Orchestra tuning from Sound Ideas. Der Wetter aus den Gaga with Barbara Bonney. Darkwood One by David Darling. Music Box by Alexis Freeman. And finally, Tale of Rigoletto with Kurt Dester. Please join us next week for the very dramatic conclusion of Paul's Case by Willa Cather. And remember, you can reach me at Fast Asleep with Gina Marie 44 at gmail.com, where you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And please. Keep us right here for you with your comments, your likes, oh, and yes, those subscriptions. Thank you so much for listening. Keyword exhilarated. Good night. Take off, steal off.